Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming out on a rainy morning. I'm Joel. I'm a teaching guy here at uh, Crossroads, and it's, we're going to continue our series today called Big Dreams and Other Disasters. I thought that was kind of a funny title, but anyway... <laughs> Uh, the, the reason I think it's a funny title is because so many times I've seen people that they've got a big dream in their heart and they go after it and then they realize that it was, it, getting the dream wasn't the hard part. The hard part was not messing it up once you have it. Yeah. You ever felt that? You're like, I got, I got the woman of my dreams and then I realized how hard it was to stay married, right? I got all the money and then I realized getting the money wasn't the hard part. We're not doing something stupid with it once I had it was the hard part. And so many times God puts a dream in our heart and we get things, the kind of the cart before the horse and we mess things up once we get the big dream. Or in the process, as we're looking at this story, we're looking at the story of Abraham and and how the idea, the first week of the series, we talked about the idea that, that it's obedience to God that makes the dream come true, but it's wisdom that, that makes that keeps you from unnecessary suffering in the process. Because how many times in our lives is it our own decisions, bad decisions that bring pain upon us? And uh, there's, there's necessary suffering in, in, in life. There's stuff we have to go through to learn stuff. But then there's also stuff that, man, you look back and go, ah, if I would have just known a little bit different, I wouldn't have had to deal with that. It was unnecessary suffering. Today I want to talk about something that literally could change your life. Now some of you here I know this morning, you have no problem with what I'm going to talk about, okay? But others of you, you have a real problem with this. So I want to talk uh, to both, both of you. I want to talk to people that have got this down because I think some of you maybe that have got this down, you do it too much to an extreme. And then others of you, you need to learn how to do this. So we're going to talk today about learning how to say no. But we're going to do it in the context of something that I would call uh, learning to not be too passive, okay? So a few years ago, my wife and I, we were living in Mexico. I've told the story of living in Mexico and uh, how horrible it was for me to living in Acapulco. It was rough. I love Mexico, but man, where we lived in Mexico was, whew, it was rough. And uh, we, we had a friend of mine, and he called me. He's like, hey, man, I've got a, a friend of mine whose daughter really wants to go on the mission field, and she'd like to come and serve as an intern with you guys. And I thought, oh, that's cool. Can I, can I talk to her? And he's like, well, yeah, yeah, well, I'm, I'm setting it up for her dad and blah, blah, blah. And so she wants to come down there and serve with you guys. And I go, okay, well, okay. Well, let me talk to her. So he's like, okay, well, day later I get a phone call and it's this girl's dad. And he's like, oh, my daughter really wants to serve on the mission field. She's going to go down there. It's going to be really great for her. And, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. She's got some friends and she'll be away from those. And it's going to be an awesome time for her to serve the Lord. And I'm like, that's so great. Can I talk to her? Well, we'll we'll, we'll get her on the phone here soon. She's super busy. She's super busy. Um, Okay, well... Day three goes by. My friend, who's a friend of the dad, calls me. He's like, hey, man, we got our tickets all booked. We're coming down. We're bringing her down. She's going to be down there um, indefinitely. We just got her a one-way ticket. I'm like, okay. Uh, Can I talk to her? I want to hear her heart for what's going on down here. Oh, man, she's excited about it. It's going to be so good. And she's got some friends she needs to get away from. But So it's going to be really a good experience for her. Y'all know where this is going, right? I'm like, okay, well, the next day her dad calls me. Hey, we're super excited. She's super excited to be going on and serving with you guys. The tickets are bought, um, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, can I talk to her? Oh, yeah, we'll get her on the phone here soon. Never meet her until the day she's at my front door. Long story short, she ends up falling in love with the worst dude in the neighborhood, the head of the gang. It was crazy because when she got there, our Bible study numbers like tripled. And uh, I called the director of the ministry. I'm like, dude, it's like amazing. The Lord is, there's like revival breaking out. He's like, we had like three times the number of people at our Bible study this week. And he goes, were they all guys? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, they were. And he's like, it's because you've got a girl intern, bro. And I was like, no, no, it's because of my amazing preaching. He's like, (laughs) he's like, no, it's because you got a girl. 
Sure enough, he was right. I was looking back at my journal. I used to journal every day we were in Mexico, and I remember writing. I was like, I'm so mad at him for saying that. It was my amazing... I didn't essentially say that, but, but he was right. Anyway, she falls in love with a gang leader. I have to send her home. The gang leader gets mad at us, and we're holed up for like a week in our house because he's threatening to do something to us because he's so mad about the whole thing. Throughout that whole week of being holed up in my house, worried about what the gang was going to do to us, I remember thinking, Ugh, I should have just said No. I don't care if the tickets are bought. But you know, you know how it just kind of unfolded slowly? And I'm like, eh, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. It wasn't all right. Here's what I know about all of us in this room, okay? You've got something in your life right now that the reason it's gotten so bad is because somewhere early on, you should have just said no. <laughs> and you know it too. But the problem is, it's just so hard sometimes. And, and here's the thing. Okay, so everybody in this room, uh, there's these five big, and I'm going to jump into psychology here for a second, and then we're going to look at some Bible verses about this. There's five big personality traits that they've basically concluded scientifically. Everybody is kind of driven by these three, three things, neuroticism, um, openness to, to experience, and one of them is, is called agreeableness, okay? And agreeableness is your willingness to kind of go along to get along, and there's more agreeable people in the world than there are what are called disagreeable people. And it's important that there are agreeable people in the world because we need people to get along. Okay? But, but here's the thing. Agreeableness, they're, they're the people that are like, well, it'll be okay. But they're, they're always worried about saying no and disappointing someone or inconveniencing someone. My wife is a very agreeable person. Okay, so I'll be walking through the grocery store and she'll be like, Joel, get out of the way. You're blocking the whole aisle. I'm like, I have every right to own this piece of land here in the grocery store while I'm walking through. And she's like, you're, you're blocking the aisle. I'm like, no. Generally on a test, I, when I, I am very disagreeable. <laughs> I don't. I don't really care if, honestly, here's one of my mottos. I don't care if you love me as long as you respect me. That's good. Amen. 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 That's not from the Bible, but it's just Joel, right? That's not necessarily a godly trait, okay? But Emily's always worried about disappointing people. If she commits, she doesn't, like, people ask her to something, she'd be like, well, I don't really want to go, but I'm going to say yes because I don't want to get, and I'm like, say no. And she's like, no, I don't want to, there's no reason to say no. I'll just, I'll absorb it, the discomfort of it, so that they don't feel uncomfortable. And here's what I know about everybody in this room. About 75% of you are very agreeable. And you regularly find yourselves going, ah, and you find yourself resentful, of it, like it takes a while. It's been like six months, but you're all of a sudden like, why do I dread doing this? You're resentful of it because you just couldn't say no. Then there's others of you that say no to everything. <laughs> and you wonder why you feel so lonely. <laughs> That's my problem. Nobody wants to be my friend. Well, you say no to everything, Joel. This is the nature of it, okay? So this is the framework for you today. You're maybe one of those people that's 75%, maybe 80% this morning that say, you know, I just try and generally go along. I don't like to cause waves. I don't want to make people upset. I don't want to be disagreeable. And then there's us, me, the disagreeable ones with me, okay, here. And, and we're, we're both going to learn something this morning, okay? We cool with that? The topic we're talking about today is passivity, okay? And passivity is basically this. Passivity is not saying no or not addressing something when it should have been addressed. And we've been talking about how Abraham, ultimately, obedience got him the promise. But as you look at his life, he made some decisions along the way that really caused him some unnecessary suffering. Wisdom is what helps you avoid unnecessary suffering in the process. So when God gives you a dream, you've got a dream for something for your family, You've got a dream maybe to marry your dream guy or girl. You've got a dream for your kids. You've got a dream for your finances. God often puts dreams in our hearts that are way bigger than anything we can accomplish on our own. And here's the thing. He wants to accomplish it so that he'll show you that it's not about what you're able to do, but about what he's able to do through you. But here's the thing, in the process, we get all nervous and doubtful, and what if God's forgotten me? And in the process, we often make decisions that are very unwise, and we create a lot of unnecessary suffering. 
And one of the things that we see in the life of Abraham is he had a pattern of passivity. A lot of times he should have just said, nope, it stops here. But he was like, eh, it'll be all right. And I don't want to do, I don't really want to confront. And, 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 and here's the thing. As we start this morning, my general conclusion about God is that this, God is a yes God. Okay? In fact, I believe that in general, you should set your default answer for anything that is put in front of you to yes. You know, in, in, the, in the story of Adam and Eve, in Genesis, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he was a yes God. He's like, you got the run of this place. Do whatever you want. Eat, drink, be merry, have sex all day long. You got the place. Just don't do one thing. There was one thing. One no. And of course, what did we run to? No, right? Uh, when I used to work with youth, I always noticed that we'd have a, I worked with a youth group of about 500 kids. And we always had, you know, one or two kids that were problem kids. And we'd have a new kid come in that was also a problem kid. And within five minutes of youth group starting, the two problem kids that should never have met each other, they found each other. <laughs> like, the two, you guys should not be together. That's a bad combination. But they somehow like, it's like a magnet, right? Anyways, I don't know where I was going with that. But the, <laughs> the nature of that is, it, I think the default should be set to yes. But here's the thing, unless there's specifically, your yes could specifically conflicts with the vision God has given you for your future, then you must say no. God said, you've got the run of the place. But here's the thing, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's going to be a mess. So don't do that one thing. That's all I'm asking. In general, God is a yes God. And I believe that we should be open to new experience. That's one of the personality traits is openness to new experience, too. We should be open. Uh, but here's the thing. If you, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for everything. For, for everything. Like anything that, if anything is yes, there's got to be some no's. Okay? That's what Proverbs 29, 18 is saying. It says, where there is no prophetic vision, prophetic just meaning you've got a picture of what your future needs to look like. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. What he's saying there is basically, when you've got a clear vision of where you want to go, you know what to say no to. And you know what to say yes to. But when you don't, it says the people cast off restraint. You just say yes to everything with no consideration of where this is going. I see people all the time, man, I want to marry a godly man. And they go searching for the man at bars. <laughs> generally not the place godly men hang out to pick up women. I see people, man, I want to be, I want to be generous and, gen and you know, blah, blah, but I can't start tithing yet. I'm like, well, tithing is kind of a baseline, right? There's all these things we want for our future. Well, I want to be, man, I want to be super successful down here, but yet every, you know, I want to have a lot of money in the bank, but every month you spend more than you make. And it's not because, it's just because of decisions you've made. Okay, now I, I get there are some seasons of life where you literally are spending every penny you make because it's just, things are tight. But a lot of times, like if we're honest, do you really need that cable plan? Yes? Okay. Well, here's the thing we're going to talk about in a minute. You can, you got every, life is all about what you're willing to sacrifice. You can pay here or pay there. So you just got to decide where you're going to pay, right? But we say, oh, I'm, I'm spending more than I make. But yet, you, you know, you're spending all this money that you could cut back on in, in order to set us some money aside for your future, okay? This is just a reality of life. This is wisdom. And a lot of people, they have dreams that they never see come to pass because they just make decisions in the process that are unwise, and they sabotage themselves. And God's like, man, I want to throw you a bone here. But every time I do, you choke on it. That's good. That's good. Sorry, I'm preaching kind of intense. Let me calm down here. But here's the reality. Where there is no vision for your future, you're going to say yes to everything. And I believe you should be open to experience. But you've got to have a very clear picture of where you're going to go. And then you're going to know what, you're going to, what you can say no to. What you have to say no to. Right? Man, what do they say? Uh, if you want to fly with the eagles, you don't hang around with turkeys. Come on now. Amen. That's good. <laughs> and a lot of times you say, man, I want to go hang out. I want to be like that guy over there. Well, that guy doesn't hang around with the people you hang around with. 
And the people you're hanging around with, they're going to bring you down. You're the average of the five people you hang out with most. You say, well, no, I'm smarter than all of them. No, probably not. <laughs> you're the average. This is the reality that when we've got a clear vision, and this is why it's so important for you to articulate what do you feel God is calling for you and your family to do. For example, with my family, my dad had really strict rules about what we could watch on TV. And I'd be like, Dad, can't we watch? Nope, nope, we're not going to watch that. Why? Because we don't do that. We are mom, the mom family. And the mom family, we don't let any unclean thing come before our eyes. And here's the thing, as a parent, I believe your default answer should be yes, unless you've got a really clear vision for no, but you better have a clear vision for no, or your kids are going to fall for anything. Would you accept in moderation? Your kids will embrace in excess. Wow. That's good. That's good. My dad grew up, he, was an he had an alcoholic father. So in our home, no alcohol. Does dad have a problem with alcohol? Uh, he could potentially, but he doesn't even go to see if he does, right? And, but he doesn't care. You know, other Christians can drink alcohol, but he knows that's a weakness in my family's line. So he just cut it off. Teetotal. No alcohol was ever seen in our home because he knew what you accept in moderation, your kids will embrace in excess. He knew what he needed to say no to based on his weaknesses. And there's some stuff in your life that you know you probably need to say no to based on your weaknesses if you truly want to go that direction that you have that future for you. Where there is no vision, you just say, take everything. But when you've got a clear vision, you know what to say no to. And you don't say it haughty and up, you know, well, that's, I'm not going to hang out with you guys because you're losers. No, you say, look, <laughs> what you guys, your vision for the future and I, my vision for the future are very different. And God bless your vision for the future. But where I'm going, I can't do that anymore. I can't keep doing that because it's not going to get me where I want to go. You've got to have the vision. If you look at the life of Abraham, what got him in trouble over and over again was just letting stuff slide. He, didn't, he knew where he was supposed to go, but he would let stuff slide. So for example, you see with Abraham, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred. We talked about this a few weeks ago. He said, leave your family. In Mexico, anybody that's kind of loosely related to you is your primo, right? So he says, leave your family and all your primos and your father's house, the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. God's promised him. I got great things ahead for you, Abraham. I need you to just step out. But here's what Abraham does. It says, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him. And Lot, his nephew, his primo, not really his primo, but went with him. And I was talking to a friend of mine. I said, was that disobedience? He's like, I don't think it was disobedience. It's just something that Abraham allowed to happen. It wasn't willful disobedience. But how many times in our lives do we just kind of go, well, that little compromise, eh, it'll be all right. It's not worth confronting Lot. He wants to come with me. It's not worth addressing. But God had specifically told Abraham, you need to go away from your family. And here's the interesting thing about Lot. If you read the whole story, he brought a, a lot of problems to Abraham. In fact, Abraham didn't inherit the promise until Lot had been moved out of the way and was living in a cave. Major problems brought on because he just let Lot come along. Eh, well, it's not worth confronting him. And he is family. Passivity. He should have said no, but he didn't say no. And it ended up costing him a great price over time. Now, here's the thing. It was his obedience that still got the promise for him. But he created a lot of suffering for himself in the meantime. And that's the same in our lives. What's the thing right now that you're going, I know I should say something, but uh, I don't want to make an awkward family situation. And, and honestly, I probably should have said no back then, but if I say no now, it's just going to be even messier. Here's the thing. There's this, there's this thing called uh, the law of entropy. And it basically says all things eventually fall into disorder. If you ignore a problem, it will not go away. It will get bigger. So there's some stuff that's been building, like in your marriage, and you know it's been building. Yeah, well, but it's just not worth it. There's some stuff that people have been maybe suggesting. That you're like, well, if we did, we could, you know, we could go that way, but I know that's not the best thing for us, but we could go that way. If you look at the story of Abraham, you see that with, with his story with, with uh, God had promised him to be the father of many nations, but he didn't have any kids. How's that for a promise? You're going to be the father of many nations. I don't have any kids. So his wife, Sarah, has an idea. She had no children. 
But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. So go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Hey, that sounds like a decent idea. Of course, Abraham agreed. <laughs> what guy wouldn't? Hey, I have a younger, foreign, exotic looking woman here for you. Do you like her? Yes, yes, that's a great plan, dear. <laughs> More problems emerged from this. In fact, we're still dealing with some of those problems. Arabs versus Jews comes from this situation here. The rockets that are being fired into Israel right now. There's a lot of political involvement. It's not as simple as that, but it's generally an eth ethnic issue. And it started with these two brothers that would come from this passivity by Abraham. Hey, that's okay. That's a decent idea. And God forbid I say no to a great opportunity. <laughs> I have my wife's approval. And, and, and that's what happens so many times. And then things fall into disorder. Because here's the thing. The natural order is to fall into disorder. Unless you're constantly vigilant about what's going on in your life. And this is where it's so important, guys. You can never afford to go in neutral. Say, but I'm tired. I'm tired. I get it. I get it. But as soon as you go into neutral, you run the risk. You know, you just stop, you stop creating the boundaries, stop going after that vision. You run the risk. When there is no vision, you run the risk of just going for anything. I see so many people that their marriage falls apart because they don't have a vision for it. And they get bored. And we don't like being bored, so we find things to occupy ourselves with. And those things end up creating division in your marriage. Is unity a focus in your marriage? Is it? Or are you just going to kind of passively, I'll watch TV every night in, you know, separate rooms, do your own thing. You're over here across the couch skimming through Facebook. She's over there skimming through Instagram. With your kids, what are you letting them watch? Is it stuff that feeds into the values you want to teach them? Here, here's, here's the thing. Your kids are getting an education all around them of stuff that's completely opposite of what God wants for your family. Are you going to sit by and let that education be infiltrating them? I heard a guy say the other day, he said, you send your kids to Caesar and wonder why they come home as Romans. Wow. That's good. Are you cool with what your kids are being fed? Because we live in a very dark and wicked world. And you're wondering why your kids are getting depressed. Well, first of all, are you living out the hope that Jesus has for you? Are you living in that? Because it starts at home. But here's the crazy thing. Wherever you send your kids off to school, they're getting pumped full of despair and discouragement and, and nihilism. And there's anti-human, anti-hope teaching. Y'all are very silent, and I know this is hitting home, because you're wondering, like, how did my kid, what's happening? I didn't raise my kid to be like this. Well, you didn't, but the world that you sent them to did. Amen. And we're getting to a point in our world, guys, where the black is getting a lot blacker, and the white is getting a lot whiter, and the dark is getting a lot darker, and the light is getting a lot lighter. Amen. And, and it's becoming really clear. What are you going to do about it? We have to find a hill to stand on and defend. So are you going to defend the hill? Or are you just going to passively say, hey, I'll let my kids run with, with the turkeys. And then you wonder why your kid turns out a turkey. That's good. That's, I know that's a little simplistic, okay. But that's the reality of it. When you've got a vision for your family, my dad exemplified this for us. He set a clear vision. He said, we are the Malm family. Why? Well, dad, everybody else watches those movies. I know, but we are the Malm family. And we don't do that because here's the vision where we're going. And he drove that vision into us. And he brought us into that vision. It wasn't just a vision he had for himself. It was a vision he had for the family. And we got a sense of identity and purpose from that. And I never felt the need to go get approval from the goofballs in the world and the things they were doing. Because my dad had a razor sharp vision. He lived courageously. He lived, you know my dad, he's a super chill person. But he lived with vision and courage. And you got to be doing the same thing. Because if you're passively accepting everything, don't doubt your kids are watching, aren't watching you. They're watching everything you do. You know that. That's why you don't want to be like your dad, because you watched him. You've got to keep an eye as a leader of your family, as a, as a mother, as a father. If you're a single mother, single father, you've got to have a laser-focused vision. 
because you've got to know what to say no to in this world. And there's a whole lot of stuff you got to say no to. But here's the other thing. There's a whole lot of stuff God wants to put in your path that you should say yes to. Amen. A lot of adventure he's called you to, greater things than you can even imagine for yourself. But if you've got all your energy on stuff you should have said no to, you're not going to have energy to say yes to the right things that he puts in your path. And, and here's the thing. You've got to make this decision every day because there's an easy path that comes every day. There's an easy option that shows up every day. Well, you could do this now. But here, here's the thing. Listen, this is a general rule of life. You can pay it now or you can pay it later. You're going to pay one way or another. But it's always cheaper to pay now. It is. Think about it. Here, here's this, this car payment. Just two thirty dollars a month. How much is the car worth? $20,000. But wait, if I pay two thirty dollars a month over... I end up paying $27,000. Yes, but you don't have to pay it till later. But I'm paying more. Yes, yes, but you won't see that in the meantime. You'll just pay the two thirty dollars a month. Isn't that how they hook you? Yeah, there's always like this fine print. And life is no different. You can pay it now or you can pay it later, but I can guarantee you it's always cheaper to pay it now. And sometimes what you've got to do is you've got to buckle down and say, what do I want? for our family? What does God want for our family? How are we going to be obedient to that? And what are we going to have to say no to to do that? And you may have to get crazy. People look at you and go, you nuts, man. My dad at one point, he threw out our TV. I came home and I'm like, dad, where's the TV? He's like, I got rid of it. It's doing nothing good for our family. I was like, well, what are we supposed to do now? He's like, I don't know, figure it out. And we did. We lived a complete, full, happy life, not getting our mind filled with junk. There's so many things in your life that are contrary to what God wants for you, and we just let them fly. We're passive about it. And it's not going to work anymore, guys, because the dark is getting darker, but the light is getting lighter. And you can passively accept it, but it's not going to go where you want to go. And you're going to create a lot of unnecessary suffering for you. And here's the thing, making the right choice is going to create some suffering. But there's reward on the other side of that suffering. When God says, wow, you didn't conform any longer to the pattern of that world. You were transformed by the renewing of your mind. And now you're able to test and approve what God's will is for your life, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Because you refused to conform, to passively accept everything that's being fed to you. And this is hard if you're an agreeable person. I get it. I'm grateful for agreeable people. But here's the thing. Some of you agreeable people are going to have to stand up against the culture that is really wicked in many ways. And you're going to have to say, man, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be different from them. But you know what? You're going to have to. Because otherwise, you're going to be swept up in the tide of the wickedness that's around us. Do you guys receive that? I know it's super intense. It's not a positive note, but here's the positive note. This stuff pays off. I'm living proof of it in my life. My dad, man, he was vigilant about saying no to things for our family that were not leading us where we wanted to go. He set a vision, and man, I'm standing on the shoulders of a giant now. I got a head start in my life. Some of the stuff that people, I, I had a guy recently, he's like, dude, where did you learn that? You're only 40. And I'm like, it's because my dad. He set me on the path of that. He had a vision. He set those things, those set that up. And here's the thing. You may have had a bad start with your parents. So you're, you're, the vision for you is really clear. You need to be what your parents were not. Don't despise them. But you need to set it up and you say, you know what? We're taking our children to the next level. We're raising them to the next standard. And we're not going to fit in. We're going to be weird. The Bible says we're a peculiar people already. So just embrace it. You should be peculiar. You should be different. And it's not an arrogant difference. They look and go, you're different. Yes, I am. Let me tell you what the difference is. Do you guys receive that? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you have called. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.